we don't often see much improvement when people have cognitive decline associated with Alzheimer's, but they saw simply by getting folks' magnesium levels up. They saw that their brain's aging reversed, their cognitive ability improved, simply by addressing this one key nutrient. Hi everyone, Drew Broad here. Today's guest is my dear friend, Sean Stevenson from the Model Health Show, and we're talking about the top foods and nutrients for better brain health. Fascinating conversation, stay tuned. Let's jump right in. And I wanna talk about top foods mm -hmm. for brain health and nutrients. I mean, there's so much out there, and I'm sure people come to you for a ton of advice. And one of the things that you see, especially when people are starting off, they're like, which supplement or which thing is the best for that? Yeah. And we tend to overlook some of the most obvious stuff that's right in front of us. Yeah. And I feel like that's what you did a really great job in Eat Smarter, yeah. is you highlighted the things that it's just easy to overlook and the power of food truly is being medicine. Not like medicine, but medicine for real, yeah. right? Sometimes even better. And I wanna start off by this study that you mentioned inside of Eat Smarter, mm -hmm. and it was around Alzheimer's yeah. and a particular nutrient. Tell us what that nutrient is and how this nutrient was shown to have a significant reversal on our age. Yeah, so the current science, when we're looking at Alzheimer's, you know, it's a really, really difficult situation. There's not much as far as peer-reviewed evidence on being able to reverse this condition and see much improvement. It's a lot of times just trying to slow down the progression. But now there's so much evidence coming out and so many wonderful scientists are asking these questions like, what can we do? Let's try this thing, let's try that thing. And the funny thing is it's circling back to the world of nutrition, but it of course makes sense because your brain is literally made from food. And we know today that you know Alzheimer's is largely tied to this, we're calling it type three diabetes, this right. insulin resistance taking place in the brain. And so looking at what are the nutrients that help to regulate our insulin response? What are the nutrients that help to uh, normalize and heal brain cells to create neurogenesis and spark the creation of new brain cells? We know some of this data, so what is the application here? So this nutrient that I'm gonna tell you about is tied to something else, which is the main thing that your brain is made of, which is water, all right? And this is so, again, you mentioned this, simple, but it's so overlooked. Uh, right around 75% of the brain is actually made of water. And we say that, but we don't really get in and really honor it. So the structural integrity of the brain itself. So the white matter, the gray matter, the, cere the, the, the cerebral spinal fluid, like that liquid that the brain is kind of housed in and taking care of, kind of pre creating a condition or shock absorption. All of this is based on water, but it's not just water. And this is one of the big problems that I was taught in my university and even high school and even elementary. We were inundated with this idea that water is H2O. That's it, H2O. And that is a massive mistake because in nature, you never find H2O by itself anywhere. It doesn't exist. Through our evolution, water is known as a universal solvent because it's always combining with things in our environment. And so what water really is, as far as what we've evolved consuming, is H2O with other things dissolved into it, specifically minerals, right? So that mineral density determines things ranging from the pH the total dissolved solids, all those things. And this, these minerals are, are incredibly important in the construct of water because they enable connect, conduct, conductivity if we talk about electrolytes specifically, right? So what are electrolytes? These are minerals that have an electrical currency or an electrical potential, right? And our body is running on this electrical currency. And so one, of, and I'm gonna share with you two of these. I'm gonna share the one that you mentioned uh, in a moment, but I wanna share one that is more obvious. Well, not so obvious today actually, which is sodium. And sodium has been found, this was research at McGill University, found that sodium works as an on-off switch in the brain that literally is turning on neurological programs and turning them off, many of which protect the brain against neurological diseases. We don't hear about the importance of sodium. We hear it more demonized. Right? It's vilified as this bad guy causing high blood pressure, causing issues with brain health. But it's without context. There's no nuance there. It's just like, this thing is bad. Be careful. Watch your sodium. Watch your salt. And these things are used interchangeably. And that's another problem. Because salt isn't sodium, but it is our biggest dietary source of sodium. Salt is about 60% chloride, 40% sodium. But there's many other types of salt. There's magnesium salt. There's potassium salts. 
But what folks really kind of get mixed up is that the biggest intake of our sodium is from processed foods in our culture today in, in the standard American diet. So about 70 to upwards of 80% of the sodium people are taking in are from highly refined, hyper-processed foods. And so when you start to move away from that a little bit, all of a sudden we can find ourselves in a sodium deficiency. And you would think again, like that's not a bad thing, but sodium is a major electrolyte concerning your neurological function. So again, researchers at McGill University found that sodium works as an on off switch in the brain that determine things like memory, uh, reaction time, but also they protect the brain against neurological diseases. So that's one. The other electrolyte that's found with water usually in nature, sodium, and the one that you mentioned earlier is magnesium. So this was an adventure to get to this point because this is so fascinating in the context of Alzheimer's. And this was a, and I love this, it's a double blind placebo controlled clinical trial. And this was published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and it found that improving magnesium levels in adult test subjects, and these folks were between 50 and 70 years of age, could potentially reverse the brain aging in the brain by almost 10 years, all right? Now, specifically looking at Alzheimer's disease, this was published in the journal Neuron, found that magnesium is able to restore critical brain plasticity and improve cognitive function. And neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to adapt and to evolve. And looking at this specifically with Alzheimer's patients, and again, I mentioned this earlier, this is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial we don't often see much improvement when people have cognitive decline associated with Alzheimer's, but they saw simply by getting folks magnesium levels up, they saw that their brain's aging reversed, their cognitive ability improved simply by addressing this one key nutrient, but it's not just some isolated magical nutrient. It works in concert. There's none of this is operating in a vacuum. That's why I mentioned sodium first. All of this works together to create this kind of whole brain functioning, if that makes sense. You know, I think that for anybody who's listening and has been told by their doctor, all mostly well-intentioned or a nutritionist or just seen it on the news, you know, all the things that sodium is associated with in high amounts, it, it can feel like a very scary world. It can feel right. like, oh, I can't put, you know, this, this homemade broccolini that I made that is you know, organic and is really good. And now all of a sudden I'm worried about adding some, some sea salt to it, right. right? You don't have to have that fear. I actually was at a restaurant. This was in New York. This is almost like 10 years ago when I was living in New York. And I was sitting there and we were eating at this great place, uh, great restaurant. And they had some Himalayan sea salt, right? Which is like, you know, my preferred, one of, one of my preferred salts that were there. And I was having a business meeting with, uh, with someone and I grabbed it and I just put a bunch, you know, some salt on there for, for taste and a ton of olive oil. And the, the person was, uh, you know, they're looking at me like in shock. So aren't you worried about like your sodium levels? And, you know, at that time, I didn't have all the references that I have yeah. now. Some of the things that you just talked about. And I was like, I'm not. And what I didn't know exactly at that time was, Yes, you can be worried about sodium and blood pressure and other stuff, but you have to understand, as you mentioned, that most of what that comes from in the modern day diet today is the processed food. So don't worry about the salt that you're sprinkling on your food because that actually is crucial for you. Instead, let's pay attention to the processed foods that are made in the factory that are loaded up with the salt that we don't see. Exactly. And Eat Smarter actually detailed a massive meta-analysis looking at the association between sodium and heart disease. And the original data that came out, again, this was decades ago, and we know that so many of our dietary tenets were false in the first place when we shifted from, you know, demonizing fat, right, going to the low-fat paradigm, and in place, adding in more carbohydrates and more sugar, and just looking at the results, what happened in our society the last few decades. But another thing that was vilified was salt and sodium. But the original data on that, and I kind of detail it for everybody to map it out was first done on laboratory animals was done on rats and they gave them 50 times the the equivalent of 50 times the amount that an average human would take in and then they were like oh wow it it blew up their uh high, their blood pressure this is this must be bad for our blood pressure so that was the original science which is great we can get a hypothesis going but then we have to run some some clinical studies on this and so this was a Cochrane database of systematic reviews massive meta analysis and they found that even salt intake above the RDA, so we're looking at over two teaspoons a day, does not have a negative impact 
on blood pressure for the vast majority of people. Now, there are some genetic predispositions. For sure, we have to acknowledge that. But for most folks, it's still well within range for optimal function. And as a matter of fact, what they found was folks who don't have enough sodium intake, so this is you know, somewhere in the ballpark of one teaspoon or less, are even high, at a higher risk for high blood pressure. Now, that's, that's totally counter culture, counterintuitive. People don't hear about that. That not getting enough sodium can cause high blood pressure in a roundabout way. What it does is increase stress hormones. It creates insulin resistance. Sodium, again, I was talking about this earlier, these electrolytes helping to modulate and manage insulin sensitivity within the brain. And this, I'm not just saying that just because it sounds nice. This is one of the things that is so overlooked when we're talking about what we're calling type 3 diabetes. And just to be clear, sodium isn't just coming in the form of salt. It's also abundant in many foods, natural foods. And so just by getting a consistent intake of real whole foods, we're going to get a pretty decent amount of sodium. But I want folks to realize just how many processes sodium is involved in. Again, this is an electrolyte. So it 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 provides this electrical currency, this electrical energy and transmission for signals. So in the brain, it helps in something called signal transduction. So for your brain cells to be able to talk to each other, which is kind of important. You know, you want your brain brain cells to be cohesive and communicating efficiently. And so when we run into these deficiencies, we start to see this rapid decline in cognitive performance. But again, if we're getting this intake of sodium in from processed foods, along with the thing that creates massive degradation to the brain in the form of sugar, this is creating this kind of chemical soup where a lot of negative things can happen, but we don't want to demonize one thing, throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm probably never going to say that again, by the way. Like, who's ever thrown a baby out with the bathwater? It's a terrible <laughs> analogy. But speaking of water and that bathwater, you know, your brain is, again, the primary, the primary substance that the brain is made of is water. And there was a really cool study that was done and published in Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise. And what the researchers discovered was that just a 2% drop and our body's baseline hydration level led to significant cognitive decline. Specifically, they found that there was a drop in requirements in the brain for attention processes, motor coordination, executive function. So there was a decline in the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for social control, for decision-making, for forethought. All of these functions started to decline simply because we're dehydrated. Again, just a 2% drop, that's not much. Our brain does not really tolerate dehydration very well. And so, again, we're all, many of us are looking for that, that next nootropic. We're looking for that thing to give us that limitless experience, but overlook the most fundamental thing, which is water. If you're not meeting that need, water with our electrolytes, we're really missing the point. And we're trying to, basically it's window dressing trying to target things with all these other incredible nootropics. But we're talking about things that can operate in the 5 to 10% improvement range versus the very foundational thing when we're talking about water and electrolytes that the brain itself is made of. So on a practical level, you and I both, we're in front of a laptop a lot. We're doing interviews throughout the day. A lot of load on our brains and our mind, a lot of um, energy that they take up throughout the day, just like a lot of other people that are listening. Yeah. Do you ever... Are there signs or indications for you that I dropped a little bit in terms of, or I might be a little bit more dehydrated? Like, do you notice if you ever can't focus as much or other stuff? And do you keep like water with electrolytes around? Like what's your own process with it? You know, separate from our foundation of whole foods, which is what, you know, the book is all about. Yeah. Are there things that you do th throughout the day when yeah. it comes to water and also, you know, electrolytes like sodium? Yeah, that's a great question. And also... I just want to reiterate that sodium is one electrolyte. We also have potassium. We also have magnesium, magnesium, calcium. These are all electrolytes. So they have many of these similar functions. They do different things like magnesium is responsible for. Right now, we've identified 650 different biochemical processes that magnesium is required for. And I might have mentioned this to you the last time I was on, but that means there's 650 things the body can't do. Yeah. If and, you're deficient in and, it. And that's just what the reason, you know, the first time you came on the podcast where we talked about the book Sleep Smarter, yeah. at that time, I think it was 300 or something like that. It was 400 and yeah. something. Yep. And now since that time, now it's we 600. Keep discovering more. Right. And this is the beauty about science. But also the other side of that is realizing how little we still know. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's very dangerous when we get into this place that this is the definitive thing. 
there's no question, except when it comes to principles of of physiology and health and anatomy and biology that we do have a pretty good grasp on. And so for myself personally, absolutely, I've experienced this before where, you know, I'm running around, I've got a lot of things going on and I might happen to not get in adequate amounts of water. And I'm feeling like, man, I've got a little bit of a mental lull and something so simple, the water's right over there. Or, you know, especially when I'm working around my home office or at our studio, like there's always water accessible, but I, I might miss out on that it's a very simple thing. And so here's the big tenet, and I've got it right here with me as well. And you've got yours over to the side as well. Keep a bottle close by because you can't drink what you don't have, right? You can't drink if you don't have your eyes close to it as well. Like having this, for me, my bottle is like my friend. It's like my my sidekick. It's my, it's my Robin, all right? If I'm going to be Batman, it's my Robin. If I'm going to be... Uh, Jordan, this is my Pippin. All right, I don't know why that analogy. <laughs> but keep your bottle close to you. Get a bottle that you like. You know, I've got my show on my bottle, the Model Health Show. You know, I used to carry around after a trip to Jamaica. I had this flashy, like Usain Bolt colors bottle that I just like to have around. And it's also like a memory, you know. And so get a bottle that you like. Keep it around. Keep it handy. And as far as the electrolytes are concerned, you know, after I really dug into the research for this book, it became apparent to me how important this is, but I really had a big problem with a lot of the electrolyte products out there. A lot of folks, of course, they think about things like Gatorade or Powerade, which is absolute garbage at this point. Sure, now they've sure. got new formulas where they're pulling the sugar out. Right. After all these decades of really inundating our culture, like drink these things if you're gonna perform at a high level. And I used to, even in high school, I would, instead of getting a soda where other people were getting you know, sodas and juices, I would get a Powerade at lunch or get a Gatorade because I'm trying to be healthy and not realizing just how much sugar, high fructose corn syrup, all these other, like these things that we know today are detrimental to performance are in there as well. And the original formula, fun fact, if you're looking at something like Gatorade, had a tremendous amount of sodium in it. And they were running trials and basically finding how it improved sports performance by getting these electrolytes up. But then over time, more and more sugar was added. Mm. And that's the thing. So. Right now, I do, I'm very adamant about getting some high quality foods in that are rich in electrolytes, but also I might dabble in an electrolyte supplement that sands sugar without sugar in there. You know, maybe it's flavored with a little bit of stevia or something like that. But it is something that I find, especially when I've got a lot going on, having a little bit of an electrolyte there with my water, you definitely get that cognitive boost. And from what I remember, you don't drink coffee, right? I do now. You do now. I do now. As of recent, how long ago? <laughs> so it's been it's it's been a couple of years now. It's okay, been a couple of it. years, but for my entire life, so for like maybe I don't know thirty five years, something like that. I I never touched. Well, I had one sip when I was a kid, and that's what created the whole problem. I was just like I I literally I remember taking that drink. It was my grandmother's coffee, and, and I just didn't understand like why are her and my grandfather having such a good time they love to have their folders in their cup every morning right and i and i got a sip of it and i literally i could i thought there was something wrong with them <laughs> i'm just like is this part of getting old like why what's wrong with your mouth and i just said i'm never going to touch this stuff again yeah so yeah. well you drink it now but i think that's another big area because there's a lot of people that are like okay you know i drink a decent amount of you know water throughout the day but with most people starting off their morning with coffee, right. that's just another, it's a lot of benefits, right? A lot of studies around coffee and the right. benefits that come from it, especially, you know, you're shooting for organic, other things like that, clean coffee. But, or and rather, I should say, it is very dehydrating. Yeah. And so we've had a few past podcast guests that really deep in the space that are like, look, for every cup of coffee you have, really think one cup of coffee three to four cups of water, especially in the morning when your brain's just getting going. Because yes, you might be drinking a lot of water throughout the day, but that morning one or two cups of coffee can immediately put your body in a place where you're starting to feel a little bit of dehydration. Yeah. It can function as a, a, as a diuretic, but more so coffee, for a lot of people, they get the coffee poop, yeah. right? So it can stimulate a bowel movement. And there's many different reasons why or hypothesis around why. One of the really interesting things that I'm, this is why I love talking with you because I could talk about these kind of things. Um, but one of the in interesting things is that coffee has been found and caffeine within coffee to stimulate 
the release of serotonin. Mm. And serotonin functions, we think about that in association with, with mood, stability, antidepressant activity, anti-anxiety activity, but it also functions in the gut for intestinal motility. So literally the ebb and flow of the digestive system kind of helping to get things moving. Serotonin has a massive role in that. And it starts to make sense when we realize 95% of our serotonin is located in our gut, produced by our enterochromaffin cells in there. And so getting coffee in, getting that serotonin boost association is one of the things that I feel, it's my hypothesis that helps kind of get things moving along. But even that, stimulating a bowel movement, we're, we're, we're releasing more energy, re releasing fluid as well. And so diuretic through the colon and also through our, our urine potentially. So yeah, we wanna be adamant about water. And I'm a big proponent of water first. And many of our friends have really taken on this tenant. I've been doing it for um, 18 years now. Every day, first thing I do, you know, I'll go have a tinkle. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I said tinkle. <laughs> I go to the bathroom, I, I, I go Sounds pee. Sounds like you potty training. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just had an Im instant image of my son and the potty training, that whole thing. So I'll go pee, but then I'll go and I'll have, you know, 20 to upwards of most of the time somewhere 25 to 30 ounces of water to start my day and this is very specific because this is a time when for, for most folks are the most dehydrated you have oftentimes you've gone seven eight hours potentially without drinking anything and your body is doing a tremendous amount of metabolic processes while you're sleeping you know that you know autophagy is kicking in we know that the glial cells in the brain we know that they're more active in the glymphatic system with cleaning out metabolic waste from the brain is 10 times more active while you're sleeping than when you're awake. And all of this is happening in a water medium. This is why we know when we go pee in the morning, the urine is much more concentrated. And so, but there's still so much metabolic waste is built up in the system. We literally need to flush it out. And so getting up and having that water helps to evacuate or eliminate these, you know, potential toxins, but also these metabolic waste to create more room for new growth and, and health. So. It's very important and very specific why I do it, number one, but also we get the benefit of something called water-induced thermogenesis. So it's an uptick in our metabolism. And there was a peer-reviewed, you know, randomized controlled trial that I talk about in Eat Smarter as well, where the researchers had folks to just drink 17 ounces of water at one clip, just was, we'll just say within a few minutes. And they found that it increased their metabolic rate by upwards of 11%. And they basically burned 30 calories just by drinking water. And you do that a few times a day. And this is the interesting thing about water, and it's often left out of the macronutrient conversation. You know, we talk about fats, proteins, carbohydrates, so much infighting about that. But there's two other macronutrients that are just largely looked over when we're talking about metabolic health and also brain health. And we could talk about both of these. But alcohol is another macronutrient, and also water is a macronutrient. But water is considered to be an, 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 a non caloric macronutrient. But that's looking at things through the tunnel vision of what calories are. And we talked about that last time I was on here. Drinking something calorie free can make you burn more calories. That's a really interesting effect. Why does water do that? It's not because your water, your body's like trying to heat the water up. That's a very small percentage of what it does. It just makes everything work better. You know, all the way from your brain to your endocrine system, to your hormones, everything is operating in a water medium. It is that important. And so if we can get something across to everybody today is that water is the nootropic. It's the number one nootropic. It's the number one facilitator of our metabolic health. And if we don't have our water right, like we're just literally window dressing, we're doing things that are superficial. The whole thing starts with water. So crucial. You know, that's the beauty of the podcast medium, especially is that when you get down these deep storytelling of our health, that's like what a health class should have been, right? Because now you get excited. Now you see things in a different light. And it makes you take something. Yes, everybody says that water is important. Just like if we were in Santa Monica right now, if we went down the street and we talked to people and we said, is eating healthy important? They say, yeah, eating healthy is important. But that means so many different things to so many right. different people. Right. Now we get into the nuances of why and the storytelling of it. And you do such a great job. Let's continue that storytelling on top brain foods and mm. things that really allow us to function, think optimally, cognitive performance. And the next thing I want to get into is that I want to talk about fats. Yes. And 
there's certain fats that are able to cross the blood brain barrier, which might yeah. be worthwhile revisiting just Absolutely. to explain to folks what that is. And two of the most important and abundant fat structures in the brain are omega-3 fatty acids and EPA and DHA. Talk to us a little bit more about that and some of the research that you've come across. Absolutely. So the dry weight of the brain, so this is without water. So water is the most abundant thing within the human brain. From there, the, quote, dry weight of the brain is fat, protein, then the sprinkling of carbs and minerals is in there as well. But protein is also incredibly important in this conversation. It's not that far removed. So about 11% fat, about 8% protein. All right, so we don't want to negate protein, but fat is so freaking important of the dry weight of the brain. It's the most important macronutrient. It, your brain is literally made primarily of fat if we're talking about macronutrients. So how does this all work? Well, this starts off in the womb. And this also is carried out once we are born and we're breastfeeding. Mother's milk, if we're talking about that dietary construct, it is so abundant in fat. Specifically, about 50% of the fat found in human breast milk is saturated fat. Again, we've this is one of those things that's been vilified that it's so bad for us. Why is the very thing we know for certain that humans are designed to consume when we are born? Why is that thing so bad? If 50%, upwards of 50% of the fat in mother's milk is saturated fat. So for cognitive development of babies, and as a matter of fact, there was a study that I just came across looking at if not, not only just the saturated fat, but getting to this point, DHA and EPA, and that, con that construct, the amount of DHA and EPA in mother's milk and seeing that direct, when, when and this was a multi, country study as well. It's an observational study, but they took into account other factors as well. They did a really good job, but they found that mother's milk that, that had the highest constitution of EPA and DHA, their children performed about 20% better on cognitive skills tests. All right. So we're talking about the template for our brains and what it's made of. Now, as we move into adulthood, now, just to be clear, this doesn't mean that guzzling saturated fat is going to make your brain work better necessarily. The, the gates that allow in saturated fat actually start to decrease your but saturated fat is so important your brain makes it itself all right so your brain literally can make its own saturated fat when it needs to so getting it dietarily this isn't saying saturated fat is bad but it's also not saying that this is the primary brain fuel because it's a it's a, it's nuanced what is a primary brain fuel for our from dietary perspective is epa and dha these are critical this is one of the most important takeaways from this episode today. And so researchers that, that they decided to do, again, another randomized controlled trial. This was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition to see what is the direct impact of DHA and EPA. And so what they did was they simply gave folks an increased intake of DHA and EPA versus a placebo. And they found that the folks just within a matter of weeks consuming DHA and EPA had a dramatic increase in memory and their reaction time just by including more of these nutrients. And so that started already, I'm just fascinated by this. So I'm like, why, what's going on here? Well, these essential fatty acids, DHA and EPA, these are known as structural fats in the brain, all right? So we know about white adipose tissue, we know about you know visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, those are storage fats. The brain doesn't have storage fats, thankfully, because during times of a famine, if you had storage fats in your brain, your, your brain- And I'm eating your brain. Yeah, you'd end up eating your brain for fuel. So it's good that we don't have storage fats, but the structural fats of the brain, EPA and DHA are largely a big part of that. And what they allow for is signal transduction. Like we talked about with electrolytes, they work in tandem with electrolytes to provide plasticity for the brain cells, form, structure, strength. That's how important these essential fatty acids are. And to lean into this further, so as I was digging into this, some of the most fascinating research, and these folks, these scientists actually use fMRIs and to actually look at the brain and see what's going on in the, with the brain with intake of DHA and EPA. And they found that folks who had the lowest intake of DHA, specifically DHA was the most important, had the highest rate of brain shrinkage. Mm. So their brains were shrinking when they had a low intake of DHA and EPA as well, but DHA was even more prominent. And so what they found was that number was if it's below four, about about four teaspoons a day of DHA. I'm sorry, 
four grams. It's about four grams. Anything under that had accelerated brain shrinkage. The optimal range was six grams of DHA and EPA. These are people who had shrink-proof brains. Again, when we're talking about cognitive performance, with the brain size matters, you know, this is, this is one of those things that we don't want to lose brain volume. It's going to be correlated with a loss of cognitive function for sure if you're literally losing your brain. And so this is how important DHA and EPA are. So when I said that this is one of the most important takeaways from this episode, I want everybody to be so adamant moving forward about getting their water in and getting in DHA and EPA specifically. What are the best dietary sources? We, and this is what I love about you as well. Like we have that food first tenant. Where can we find this in its whole food form that's been used for the greatest amount of time? Number one, and this is working along with folks like, you know, Lisa Moscone out of NYU and people who are, again, looking at the brain and seeing, do these nutrients actually have an impact? She shared with me that caviar and salmon roe are the best sources of dietary DHA and EPA. And at the time, this was a few years ago when we were hanging out, caviar wasn't on my radar, you know, like I just didn't even, it wasn't, I, I didn't grow up around anything like that. So I saw it on, I literally knew it from Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous with Robin Leach. It was like a TV show. It was like the pre-cribs. Maybe a little bit of a uh, mention <laughs> on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. You know? And so this was like pre MTV Cribs. So this was like an original, like seeing how stars are living. Right. And I remember caviar and this kind of thing. So I'm just like, wow, really? Because we often attribute fatty fish, which is an incredible source again of DHA and EPA, salmon, mackerel, sardines. These are really, really dense sources. But if you're going gram for gram, you're going to find maybe three times more DHA and EPA in fish eggs than in the fish itself. So salmon roe and caviar. Now, again, I'm going to give multiple options for people. If that's not speaking to you, you don't have to run out and guzzle caviar. As a matter of fact, it'll probably cost a little bit too. So, but again, if you look at something like that, like, oh, wow, folks realize the value a long time ago of these things. They pr put a higher price point on it. The same thing with salt. The name salary is derived from the word meaning salt, the etymology of it, because people were paid in salt. I just saw this, I, I don't know what's wrong with me or right with me, but I've just watched these random documentaries and I was looking at this story of these goats. Have you seen the goats that climb up on these walls? Yeah. And they're like sideways, like what in the world are they thinking? They're like, 200 300 feet up in the air yeah, like on this vertical like completely vertical they're they're vertical and they have their babies the little yeah the little baby goats come up they're called kids right mm -hmm. the baby goats are called kids they have their kids coming up on this wall and it's just, just terrified watching this and they're doing it to be able to to lick the minerals coming out of that you know certain places that might be in that dam for example sodium right salt is so important and again there's multiple kinds of salt potassium salt, magnesium salt, they're willing to risk their life to get it, right? So anyways, putting all this back with DHA and EPA, we got salmon roe, we've got caviar, we've got whole fish, fatty fish, salmon, mackerel, sardines, and many others. And then from there we go to, and by the way, we're going to get to some vegan sources as well. This is very important. Uh, but then we go to grass-fed beef. It's going to be a great source potentially of uh, these omega-3 fatty acids. But there's a big distinction between grass-fed and grain-fed. There's data, and I go in multiple times over and over again showing the difference in grass-fed versus conventional beef in the book because people need to know that conversation. It isn't just hearsay anymore. Uh, from there, we've got eggs, the egg yolk specifically, great source of DHA and EPA, and they can even be enriched as well. Um, but now we get into... What about the vegetarian sources? And this is where things get a little bit complicated because for years as a nutritionist in my clinical practice, I was having folks, I mean, I'm talking, this was 15 years ago, hemp seeds, uh, uh, chia seeds, I'm all of it. I'm having people take you know hemp oil, get their omega threes, right? Because at the time you also were vegetarian. Yeah, so, and I've done everything. Like, and I'll do it years at a time to experiment with myself. And thankfully in my practice, I got away from having everybody doing what I was doing and instead yeah. focusing on what they need, which is really the, the move forward and what's happening now 
is personalized nutrition. That's the, the wave of the future. But, you know, That's again, it. I've been doing that and teaching that for a long time. So with that said, I was missing the point because that type of omega-3 is ALA. It's not DHA and EPA, all right? DHA and EPA are the ones that have express access into the brain. LA, ALA does have a role and is important, but DHA and EPA is so important, and your body won't do the opposite. Your body will convert ALA into DHA and EPA, but you can lose upwards of 70, 80, 90% in the conversion process, depending on your metabolism for being able to do that conversion. So to get the amount of DHA, we're, again, we're talking about that bare minimum being four grams, to get that from a plant source, you're gonna need to have a couple of cups of chia seeds. You know, like it's just not viable if you ever wanna leave the bathroom, you know? <laughs> so it's not efficient, not effective. So what do we do? We can get in some from those sources, flax seeds, hemp seeds, uh, chia seeds, all that good stuff. But I implore you, if you're doing a vegetarian approach, there's two other wrongs. We've got krill oil, which depending on where you lie in your ethics, which is, and I, I'm going to find another name for this because when I say it, just the name, I think it can throw people off. It's a microscopic shrimp. Emphasis on microscopic, all right? It is so, like you can't, it's not like a shrimp like you would think. It's microscopic and it's abundant in oceans. This is what whales primarily yep. feed on. It's so rich in nutrients that can create a massive brain like whales are hyper intelligent as well if you look at some of the the data on that as well but anyways krill is a is a viable option but it's also rich in astaxanthin which is this powerful antioxidant that helps to protect the omega-3s in there the dha and epa from oxidation nine times out of ten it's going to be a higher quality source than you might find in conventional fish oils because of that protection from oxidation and the reason I'm saying krill oil first is because we have peer-reviewed evidence on its effectiveness. All right, so we've got that with food, we've got it with fish oil, we've got it with krill oil, but not as much. Nine out of 10 peer-reviewed studies on omega-3s, DHA and EPA are done with fish oil. Right. So we've got to acknowledge that. Not saying it's the best source, and you got to be careful with your sourcing. Krill oil, it's gaining some traction, it's being studied a lot more now. The next option of full plant source would be algae oil. We do know the DHA and EPA is there, but we got to keep in mind, we don't have a lot of peer reviewed evidence on it. But at minimum, I, I want to, again, put this emphasis, I implore you to make sure today to get your DHA and EPA to literally protect your brain from shrinkage. And this isn't like it's cold outside, you get into a cold plunge or whatever shrinkage for guys. It's not that kind of <laughs> shrinkage. It's like this isn't the kind you can bounce back from easily. Right. You, you Once you shrink your brain, I mean, it's yeah. very hard to come back from that. Exactly. So. Just I want everybody to keep that in mind, how important our hydration is and DHA and EPA is absolutely critical. And, you know, I think, you know, it's, I'm glad that you went through that full spectrum because as you mentioned, you and I, we've also tried a lot of different things, raw food, vegan, vegetarian, yeah. the whole the whole gamut. And one of the arguments that was brought up back then that I also, you know, made that argument too is that, well, let's look at animals, right? Let's look at a gorilla. What does a gorilla eat? They're not eating fish, right? How is their body and brain and their muscle size so big? And the key distinction between, you know, a lot of these big animals, even whales and, you know, gorillas and, and human beings, is it, a lot of those animals are eating all day long. All day. So if you're talking about, Easily. like, just like you made that analogy of like, okay, sure, you can try to get your, you know, those essential oils and fatty acids from chia seeds, but just actually look at the data in terms of how much you're going to get and then know that human beings aren't really designed to be eating that amount okay. You're going to be pooping and eating all day long, which is not going to leave any room for anything else that's there. So we're just a distinct and a completely different animal in our evolution. So we got to find what works for us specifically. I love that. Yes, we've been we've been designed. We've we've evolved to be more efficient in digestion, to have a lot more energy for cognitive performance and creation. You know, that's the thing about humans. That's what makes us so miraculous and, you know, uh, Michio Kaku, uh, astrophysicist, he said that the human brain is the most complicated organ in the known universe. And it is like, when we have one, the coolest thing is like everybody listening, you have one of the most powerful, compli complicated, complex organs in the known universe. But we, I think that we really struggle to understand how we got to where we are today. We abandon a lot of that thinking. 
And one of the biggest steps in our evolution was the, the ability to eat more nutrient dense sources of food and to extract more energy from our food through cooking, which again, we both done long stints on raw food, for example. And we, I, I remember like, I didn't touch anything cooked except maybe some tea for several <laughs> years. And I did this in Missouri, which is not the health hub. Or like, we, there was no raw food restaurants there. I was, I felt like Tom Hanks on that island by myself many times, you know, <laughs> me and Wilson eating, uh, you know, a salad in, in Missouri in the winter. And so, but to, to completely vilify something that helped us to evolve is not appropriate. Not to say the raw foods can't be wonderful, but we got to look at the, this in all in context. And so our digestive systems became much smaller. Again, if you look at the, the other animals that subsist on plant foods strictly, there's so much energy caught up in digestion. There's so much complexity to the digestive system. You know, Multiple our stomachs in some cases, right. and, you know, just a lot more going on. It's a lot more going on. And I, I want to share this with everybody too, because I think that we don't realize just how much energy is taken for digestion just in general. The majority of our energy that we use on a day-to-day -day basis for the average person is used to digest the food that you eat. All right. So just imagine how much energy is being siphoned by constantly eating or eating the wrong stuff. And this is important because when when you realize that how miraculous eating is in the first place like we're, okay we're going to we'll just say somebody's eating that fish that we talked about we're, they're eating some salmon they're eating some uh walnuts which we'll talk about in a minute uh they're eating some you know a leafy green salad that food is going to become what you see in the mirror that food is going to become your brain it's going to become your heart it's going to become the blood in your veins, like your, your body is taking that food and turning it into human tissue. That's a freaking powerful, amazing thing to realize. Like, and you get to choose what you make yourself out of. And of course there's gonna be waste and all that kind of stuff, but you're making your body out of this stuff. So your body takes that very seriously. It's a large energy requirement to convert that food into you. You know, the, the digestion, assimilation, elimination, moving everything where it needs to go. So we start to understand how much energy is required for it. And so we want to make it count, you know, but at the same time, you know, again, we, I'm a big proponent of what are the best sources? What are the most nutrient dense sources that are backed by science and also backed by our ancestors and taking that data and putting, marrying it together. And um, another one of those that I want to share. So we talked about EPA and DHA, but we also have phospholipids and these aren't talked about very often as well. So phospholipids are primarily made from omega-3s, but you can also find them dietarily by themselves. And I wanted to share this because this is one of the coolest studies. This was a, this was done recently at double blind placebo controlled randomized trial. So gold standard of clinical testing. And this was looking at the consumption of phospholipids. And they found that having test subjects increase their intake of phospholipids, help them to enhance their attention span and also improve reaction time. But here's the important part. This was done when test subjects were put under stress. So it helped them to focus under stress. Wouldn't that be helpful today? You know, we, we're, we're inundated with stress. So phospholipids can help us to improve our focus, improve our performance when under stressful conditions. And again, this is going back to what is the brain made of? And phospholipids really function as similar with DHA and EPA, structural fats that provide shape, strength, elasticity for our neurons as well. So what are the best sources of phospholipids? Funny enough, eggs, egg yolks, far and away, great source of phospholipids. Also, we've got um, oats, krill, another great source, milk, sunflower seeds are a pretty good source, salmon roe, crab meat, this is another great source of phospholipids but again a lot is talked about in the domain of brain health along with fats but it usually revolves around big idea fats just get in some kind of fats saturated fat omega-3s phospholipids matter too and then they go into their own subsets of like phosphatidylserine there's so many other things there that we can geek out on but just proactively getting in some phospholipids i think is going to be another game changer as we move forward let's talk 
doctrine of signatures, right? And you recently did a big podcast episode on this, talking about 11 top foods for your whole body health. And, you know, I would love for you to explain a little bit more about this. And then in this context, maybe you pull out one of these foods that can be really powerful that might have, uh, that not might, that there's research around maybe some support for supporting our cognition and, and brain function. So what, what is this doctrine of signatures? Sure. So this is, what that translates to is really a sign of nature. And this is a, a certain school of thinking, a certain perspective or approach to science that basically is, is stating that everything in nature that humans interact with, that we consume as far as food, it will tell you what it's good for in the human body based on the way that food looks, how it tastes, how it functions in nature itself, the, the activities that it does. It can give you a clue as to how it can help humans. And then for me, I'm just like, that's a really interesting tenet. You know, like we tend to think we don't come here with instructions and we just try to figure stuff out. But nature has kind of given us a little bit of a clue. But I want to find, is there peer reviewed evidence to affirm this? Like, for example, you know, walnuts looking ridiculously similar to the human brain, for example. Do we have peer reviewed evidence that it is actually effective and helpful for the human brain? Because we have folk folklore, right? People right. would always say that. My family growing up, Ayurvedic, everything like that, be like, oh, have some walnuts first thing in the morning. Have some yeah. almonds first thing in the morning. But what, what did you find? So now here's the thing. Walnuts, first of all, interesting source of omega-3s, but these are plant form, but it is going to be some conversion. But one of the really cool things about walnuts that I really uncovered in the data is that it has these plant sterols, different compounds within the walnuts that can actually help to break apart beta amyloid plaque in the brain, which we know that that buildup is one of the strongest things associated with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So walnuts really do help. They have very interesting uh, brain protective capacities. And so that's just one. And then we look at pecan, right? Even if you look at the walnut itself, it like has the two hemispheres. It comes in its own cranium that's very hard to crack. Um, pecans as well has some really good data on brain health. But I wanted to mention this with the eyes, right? So there's a lot more science being done around this as well. But blueberries, people know about carrots. You know, you cut the carrot, it kind of looks like an eye. But blueberries, even more interestingly, and if you look at a blueberry, it kind of like has its... The, the, the lens and the retina, you know, the little like, if you flip it around to the other side, these kind of like little um, outlines going around that has a little bit of shape to it and kind of um, some structure. But one of the studies that I unearthed was, and this was actually done by researchers in Russia, and this was published in the Russian Academy of Sciences. And it affirmed that blueberries can significantly reduce the risk of cataracts. Right. And so also blueberries are abundant in this compound called anthocyanins. And these anthocyanins are well noted to protect our retina against UV damage. Like I don't think a lot of us realize that our eyes can get sunburned, for example. So really helpful with that. And another study, and this was published in the Journal of Neuroimmunology, found that blueberry anthocyanins may be able to reduce inflammation and oxidative stress that targets specifically breaks down the retina. All right. So. And I just was going on and on and on, finding all of this data affirming the thing that, again, if you look at the doctrine of signatures, like this food kind of looks like this human body part. Does it really help this human body part or protect this human body part? And again and again and again, I kept finding data that it's absolutely true. Yeah. And, you know, because there is so much folklore and there's long history of it and some of it that comes from sort of ancient wisdom, ancient cultures, but they didn't have the evidence. They didn't even have the scientific method at that time that was established as a way to look into these things. They didn't have the technology to be able to do that. They're not able to do these double blind placebo controlled trials. But um, because so much of it does come from folklore uh, in, in like the early, I think it was like early 2000s and 2010s, there, there was a whole bunch of articles that that came out sort of dismissing the doc the the doc, uh, doctrine of signature yeah. and primarily because even in the space that we've been in and you talk about this a lot on your show nutritional science which was first of all it's hard to fund right who's yeah. going to do it especially yeah. when you can't patent it turn it into a drug that you can then go sell for billions of dollars um it, it was it wasn't 
as much research being done in this space. Exactly. So even since that time period, yeah. I think like if you Google Doctrine of Signatures, one of the first articles that comes up is Wired Magazine, 2014, basically saying the whole thing is bullshit. But if you go back and you actually read that article and where it's coming from, it's really talking about the lack of evidence that's there. Right. And what you did recently is you're saying, let's look at the evidence that's come out. Yeah. And a big chunk of it being evidence that's come out the within last the last- Five, 10 years. Five years, 10 yeah. years, which is really, fascinating and exciting because we do need that evidence to be able to talk about it you know to really get into the nuances yeah. and that's where it's really important that's what i appreciate about what you uh, put together thank you man you know it means a lot and you know this is it's so fascinating like i think that if we if we look at the data and just have a little bit more objectivity to it and understand like there's again i said this earlier there's so little that we know and I think that there's, to just say definitively that this is the answer and that this idea that our ancestors gave us, the Doctrine of Signatures, holds no weight, it's ignorant. Like, they figured out stuff. If, we, if we're just, again, being honest, we are so less healthy and robust compared to our ancestors. And, you know, if we talk about infectious diseases being an issue back in the day, re if we take that out of the equation, we're not just talking about a longer lifespan, we're talking about a longer health span. Whereas here in the United States today, a lot of folks, you know, I shared some numbers when we were talking last time, but I've got some of the updated figures right now. And here in the United States, there's two, and this was prior to the pandemic, by the way, 242 million Americans are overweight or obese. The last time I said it was around 200 million. So I dug deeper and found 242 million prior to the pandemic it's things have gotten worse since then yeah we've got 130 million americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic right now we've got about 60 percent of our citizens have some degree of heart disease right now we're just ticking time bombs massive increases in recent decades in alzheimer's dementia uh, adhd depression cancer the list goes on and on and we're not just like what is why why is this happening and obviously our food is a big issue. You know, the American, the, the, the journal from the American Medical Association, JAMA, detailed in 2018, poor diet is the number one causative agent between, be, between our massive epidemics of chronic diseases. We know this already. We knew this already, but are we doing something about it? Food matters. And so in that context, looking at some of this stuff and having fun with it even, and I love it because podcasts like this get into the hands of researchers. You know this. We've got people listening to the show that you would never realize. You know, I, we, I, I introduced you to Dr. Amy Shaw, and that's how she found out about me years ago when she was working to improve her own health, and she found my podcast on sleep from, I think it was seven years ago she shared with me, and it was a game changer for her. And now she's a superhero out here making massive impacts and waves in circadian medicine. Like, I, I can't even put that into words. So getting this information out sparks the minds of other researchers and scientists finding creative ways to get funding to run these studies so we get this data here's another one of those and this was the probably the weirdest and craziest one for me chocolate all right we think about the end product of chocolate or even the the cacao beans right so the the root of chocolate coming from cacao beans what well, they're botanically they're kind of a seed of a fruit but if you actually look at the cacao pod itself you cut one in half lengthwise and you open it up it looks like a bunch of teeth <laughs> that are smiling at you it is the freakiest weirdest thing when you see it on camera and i went and i showed pictures of all this stuff that i went through on the episode um but it is so weird it's just like okay does this have an impact on our teeth is there some clinical evidence on this guess what this study was published and conducted by researchers at the department of pediatric dentistry at the University of Naples in Italy. And it found that polyphenols from chocolate specifically have anti-karyogenic, AKA anti-cavity effects. And the researchers found that chocolate polyphenols significantly reduce biofilm formation and acid production that is detrimental to our teeth. Now, this is even more crazy. So theobromine, they use this compound specifically, and this word chocolate gets its name. It's theobroma cacao, which translates to food of the gods in Greek. So again, this isolated compound theobromine, which has well-noted benefits for cognitive function, for cardiovascular health, but specifically for our teeth. 
And this study, and this was published in the Dental Research Journal, one of the most prestigious journals in the health of dentistry, in the field of dentistry. And this study revealed that the theobromine and chocolate-based non-fluoride toothpaste outperformed two commercial fluoride toothpastes in this clinical trial, including one of those was kids Colgate that it went up against in defending the teeth against cavity associated microbe activity. All right. So when we open up that cacao pod lengthwise and we see all those teeth, these white teeth glaring back at us and for our ancestors to be like, you know what? This might be good for our teeth. <laughs> and now today we're using our very sophisticated testing methods to basically affirm what our ancestors already knew, you know? And so there are so many different instances like that that I went through in the Doctrine of Signatures episode. It's, it's powerful, and we'll make sure we link to it in the show notes because that's a really great episode that you went through. And it's, it's not to say to put everything that was happening in the past on a pedestal. It's more just saying, where can we borrow and right. learn from? Because outside of infant mortality and, you know, Thank the Lord that we have the technology that we do, that infant mortality is way, way down in most communities. Unfortunately, still not in Native American and black community and, and some Hispanic populations as well, too. But generally speaking, we've made large strides in infant mortality. So outside of infant mortality, because, you know, people always hear like, man, our ancestors, they only used to live till 35, 40 years old. OK, yeah, but that's a huge chunk of that is infant mortality. So if one person dies at you know right. birth and another person lives till 80, then all of a sudden that's going to affect the average that's there. But once infant mortality is taken out, there are many societies and communities around the world where people lived not only into their 80s and 90s and 100, because even some communities, maybe they only lived till you know, they didn't have advanced dentistry. So if you got an infection in your tooth, that infection spread to the rest of your body and you would have died earlier. You know, accidents, cold weather, other things that we just have more protection on. But at whatever age they did pass away, they they virtually outside of an accident would be not dying from the same things that we die from today. Yeah. All the chronic conditions and diseases. You know, I hear a story about my my dad has our ancestry back to like 13 generations on his side. Wow. And, you know, we have different stories of people. It's like, oh, how did that great, great grandmother pass away? Well, she went to sleep one day and she didn't wake up yeah. the next day, right? That's the way that we all want to get a chance to go. But we got to improve our health span in that process, which is fundamentally a big part of it is that pillar of food in addition to all the things that we've talked about before. Right, right. What happened to dying of old age? Right. You know, like that's just not a thing very often today in our society. But you mentioned it, you know, and the great part is we've got a tremendous amount of data and researchers in the earlier part of the 1900s and even in the, the 1800s who were going to these indigenous tribes. You know, if you think about even Weston Price, for example, and seeing it's not just the lifespan, but the health span of folks who are eating more of their indigenous diets, living more in a, a community setting and uh, protected from the, the stressors and the abnormality of the lifestyle today. Not only are they healthier and more robust, but their teeth came in straight. You know, and I was talking about this and I think you might have talked about this with James, James Nestor as yeah. well and his great book on on breath and, and breathing. And so understanding this, like nowhere else in nature do we see these phenomenons happen with like, you know, you go to, to the zoo and you're like, or better yet on a safari and you see a tiger, you're like, the tiger has, his teeth didn't come in right or whatever, like, you know. Because the funny thing is you actually sometimes do see it at the zoo because right? now those when animals they, are not feeding eating. them their abnormal diet that we have. Right. And, and domesticating our pets as well. That's where you see these issues like animals snoring and having, uh, you know, high blood pressure and all these different things. This is by employing our way of life onto the animals that we interact with. But animals in nature, these things are so rare. It's not it's not even talked about. You know, you don't see oh this. Yeah, this, you know, this elk died from, you know, hypertension. Or you this know. wolf has depression, you know. Right, right, right. Which now there's unless it's isolated. It, unless it's isolated and it's a different situation, yeah. but it's not pervasive in the way that we see now, like where, you know, we got 
we got pet medic SSRIs for pets, right? right? Yeah. And yeah. and pets are having their teeth pulled left and right yeah. because of infection, because of not having the need to chew. You know, the interesting thing, I haven't listened to your episode with uh, with James, but I know on our episode that we had with him, one of the things that he was just sharing that was a big idea that I think a lot of the audience took away is that we take evolution for granted. We always think that we are heading in the positive right direction, but we have to understand because we've significantly modified our lifestyle, yeah. he was talking about it in the direction of our dental health, our breathing components, we're actually now seeing de-evolution. Right. So because of our processed foods, because of our lifestyle, because of the way we live, because of how we sleep and how so far off the norm these things are, we now see the human species sort of splitting into two. We have people out there, yourself, myself, individuals who actually have you know the resources to be able to listen to this information, make changes in their life, that they're continuing to head in one direction. But we have another population, part of the population that is actually de-evolving. Right. They're de-evolving. They're not headed in the right direction. They're heading in a different direction. And that's a really scary thing to see. Right now, this current generation is the first generation in recent recorded human history that's not going to outlive the previous generation. It's the first time that we're going backwards. And you would think, again, with all of our so-called advances, that we'd be living longer and this trend of increasing our lifespan would continue on, but that's not the case. There are people who are out here talking about these things and, you know, wonderful researchers, many good friends of mine, you know, from David Sinclair to, you know, you name it. But the truth is, the vast majority of our citizens are so far from that. As you mentioned, it's, it, we're really devolving in many ways. And we're seeing this rapid increase. Again, we're looking at our lifespan is similar, but we're not living longer. We're dying longer. We're just, we have a system that just sustains your livelihood, sustains your life. And by managing disease symptoms and allowing the diseases themselves to manifest in the first place. So removing your quality of life. And we don't want that. We want to be able to live life and to, I was just with a friend yesterday and, you know, she went to Okinawa and she just couldn't believe it. She's seeing folks that are like 90 years old, just riding around on their bike and they're doing all this <laughs> stuff. She's like, I, it was like a, being on a, another planet essentially. And so she was interested, like, what are the things that they're, that they're doing? And she was sharing with me things that you don't hear about in the news. You know, the, their salad is very different. You know, of course, they've got all these different herbs. It's just, you know, it's a lot of herbs, seaweed, sea veggies. And also, but the community aspect is so important. And we see that consistently with these blue zones, you know, the community aspect, how important that is and how isolated we are here in our culture today. And that's one of the things I really admire about you is like you proactively get people together. You know, you've been doing that for the, like, that's your superpower. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first found out about you in the first place, and you know you proactively get it together with your with your with your with your men's group you know your male friends and you guys doing stuff consistently we've got to do that in our world today it's so weird because the human brain isn't wired up to have all the friends that we have on social media it's just so it's so much you know it's so much but the depth is not there you know and so taking all these things into context and these are things that are supportive of our cognitive function our brain requires a social interaction in a way that we've evolved with for the social brain to develop, to develop our emotional brain to, to, to develop. And by the way, I wanted to mention this because we're here in LA and there was, when you mentioned the walnuts earlier, I didn't want to miss this. Researchers at UCLA found that a handful of walnuts a day in their study was enough to boost memory and also improve the, the rate at which, the speed at which your brain is able to process information by including that one dietary intervention. So again, that doctrine of signatures is right there saying, hey, not only is this protective of the brain, but also we can improve brain performance. And it's just by adding in some of these real foods and finding creative ways to do it. And this is, again, it's, I don't even like the term when we say it's not rocket science, but I mean, we could do, we could put a rocket in a space, but we can't manage our own bodies. <laughs> do you understand? Like we, we should say this isn't, this isn't biological science, this isn't biochemistry yeah. science, you know, because this this is really where we have an issue with. Rocket science, we're good. We could put stuff into space, we could put satellites into space, but what about the satellites within our bodies? Which, if, we, if I wanna give an analogy, it's like the receptor sites that we have for certain hormones, for example. And increasing the receptor sites or the sensitivity for serotonin, 
right? Not just what can we do to increase our serotonin, which I mentioned earlier, caffeine having an association there. But what do we know that can improve the sensitivity for insulin, right? The satellite dish, making it, you know, I remember when the satellites first hit the scene, like they were some big boys. They were big. Now everybody, <laughs> like you can just look out on people's roofs and just see these little dishes and they're picking up all this data. But we've got something that is similar within ourselves. You know, so that insulin sensitivity, leptin sensitivity, serotonin sensitivity, you know, this is this is re really what we need to be looking at, you know. So all of these things come together right now, and it provides us which, with such an adventure that we're on. Uh, it's such an adventure. And we can make it fun, you know, because that's the part about it. You know, in that episode that you did with those 11 foods, again, highly recommended for people to listen to in addition to the book. You were saying, like, look, the goal isn't to be neurotic about any of this stuff. Right? It's just that when we increase the diversity of all the things we're eating and we minimize the processed foods that are a part of our diet, we cut down on the sugar that's there. We, our body, we've set the right conditions for our body to naturally head in the right direction. Yeah. Right? We don't need to be neurotic about any of this stuff. There's a couple other top brain foods, since that's the theme that we're rolling with over here, that um, you've highlighted in the book, Eat Smarter. And I want to mention one of them that I'd love to just hand over to you. And, you know, it's gotten a little bit more traction in the last few years, but MCTs. Yeah. MCTs, you have a whole thing inside of there about a remarkable study published in the, the, um, the New York Academy of Sciences yeah. and what they found about MCTs. And I'd love you to just share a little bit. So what are MCTs? What do we find out about it? So what these researchers discover is that MCTs can help to improve the condition of Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's patients with moderate to mild symptoms seeing improvement. Again, you very rarely hear anything like that. So what they discovered was that essentially MCTs function in two ways. Number one, researchers at Yale found that MCTs are some of the rare nutrients that are able to cross the blood-brain barrier and directly feed and nourish our brain cells. Your brain is very, very choosy on what it allows in. And this is so important for us to understand. We have the blood-brain barrier or the BBB. And this barrier is so interesting in, as far as human anatomy because this is giving us a clue that the brain is an exclusive area that everything cannot get into. Like there's like your body, galaxy, and then there's this whole other solar system going on with the brain. In a sense, they're all interconnected. But there's this velvet rope and security guards there that I think about like Dwayne The Rock Johnson being a security <laughs> guard, like all, you know, like millions of him only allowing certain things in. If you're not on the list, you're not getting past the big fella, right? And there's certain nutrients that have like an express pass card that can just go right through the toll booth. MCTs are one of those nutrients. So medium chain triglycerides, and these are in that category. There's different types of saturated fat, all right? So we talked about saturated fat earlier. We've got long chain, medium chain, short chain. It's not that saturated fats are not allowed into the brain. It's the, ch the length of the chain. Medium chain triglycerides still have that capacity to, to make it into the human brain and to benefit. But the, what these researchers discovered was that, number one, they're able to do that, but the scientists found that the consumption of MCTs directly led to improved cognitive function in mild to moderate forms of Alzheimer's disease and cognitive impairment. But it wasn't just from the MCTs going into the brain, it's also from their production of ketones. It, the consumption of medium chain triglycerides trigger our liver to make ketone bodies, which if we know about Alzheimer's, there's this dramatic decline in glucose metabolism in the brain. Ketones functioning as an alternative fuel source for your brain to run these processes, right? And so these ketones expressly are able to make their way into the brain and to run processes. So MCTs work in two ways. Number one, directly nourishing brain cells themselves. Number two, triggering the release of ketones, allowing the brain to be nourished in that way as well. So really, really powerful stuff. We've got MCT oils um, that can be you know, extracted. You, of course, you want to make sure with your sourcing it's coming from ethical places without any pesticides, herbicides, all that kind of stuff in the, grow in the growing process. Coconut derived is probably gonna be better. Um, cause you have, cause there, some are like palm, palm oil, oil yeah. derived, but if you can get the coconut, that's probably gonna be the best thing. That's right. Especially with the association of whatever deforestation, other stuff with palm. Yeah. 
exactly. And he, uh, and he so so for you when you think about including that because you know we're talking mm. about Alzheimer's patients, but again we did we did a whole series of episodes on on Alzheimer's actually today on you know the Thursday that we're recording this we have an episode out with David Perlmutter all on the topic. Mm. Um, but even if, you know, I think this is really the key, even if you are not, let's say, uh, somebody who is feeling like they're at risk for, you know, Alzheimer's, or even if that's not maybe your top concern and you're looking more at performance, even for, uh, you know, just saying generally younger individuals who are not maybe Alzheimer's is the primary concern for them, MCT still will have benefits for you. Benefit in cognitive performance, but also protection of the brain. And this is even a, a bigger concern for, for, for me, for the average person. For me personally, I'm into what can make me better. Yeah. Like perform not just at that average human level, but like what can I do to, to have that's kind of what we refer to as like super human function, super human cognitive ability. But for most folks, I'm more, I'm really interested and passionate about protecting their brains, finding what are some simple things they can implement. And so MCTs have that capacity, but more so there's another oil. When I talked about the blood brain barrier, this is one of the, the biggest issues that is not being talked about right now is neuroinflammation. And this is inflammation in the brain. And the crazy thing is, and we've, we've talked about this before, but the brain itself doesn't have pain receptors. So you can't know when your brain is hurt until it's too late, oftentimes. Your brain can tell you about pain anywhere else, but it's very secretive of what's happening within itself. And one of the biggest drivers of neuroinflammation is obesity. If somebody is moving towards obesity, you know, they're significantly overweight, there's a high propensity towards, and this is from um, the, the, and you mentioned this earlier, the New York Academy of Sciences, the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences. These same researchers found that Inflammation in the brain is a, is a double-edged sword because neuroinflammation in the brain is a causative agent in creating obesity, and obesity is a causative agent in creating neuroinflammation. And we just get into this vicious circle. One of the issues behind that is obviously our massive intake of sugar in our culture today with the average person somewhere around 70 pounds of added sugar every year consumption. And your brain is like the sugar gates into the brain, the biggest pass express passes for sugar is just how we evolved but we did not evolve with this much sugar that's the thing so your brain will gladly confiscate half of the sugar that you take in from a meal it is it, it'll just sop it right up and it can create absolute havoc in the brain so with that said one of the things that starts to happen over time with our abnormal intake of sugar our abnormal intake of low quality fats our our exposure to pesticides herbicides or dentists Rodenticides, all these environmental chemicals, which there's tens of thousands e released every year into our environment that are new, and even just this past year, new chemicals. The EPA actually has approved 40,000 chemicals that are used, that are able to be used in agricultural farming, right? So the process of agriculture, let me say this better. They have 40,000 chemicals approved to be used in pesticide formulation pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides to, that are able to be used in our food supply, all right? So what happens is the breakdown of our blood-brain barrier. This is key. So when the blood-brain barrier starts to break down, that protective force, stuff starts getting into the brain that shouldn't be there. And it exacerbates this problem of neuroinflammation. Now, here's a food that can actually help to heal the blood-brain barrier. I, I couldn't believe this. I mean, I was, I, I thought the food was good there's a, a lot of good science around it, especially if we're looking at longevity but when i saw this it just blew my mind and this was from researchers at auburn university and this they published a study groundbreaking new research asserting that oleocanthal rich extra virgin olive oil is able to restore the function of the blood brain barrier mm. right oleocanthal rich extra virgin olive oil can actually heal and repair the blood brain barrier there's something about that fat. There's something about that food that literally heals the protective force, the protective mechanism in the brain, all right? Now, I wanna highlight a couple of important points here. So some of the data digs in further, you know, the, the monounsaturated fats in there appear to be very brain friendly and even have some protective effects at reducing uh, the risk of Alzheimer's. 
And one of the studies I talk about in Eat Smarter, uh, the Im implementation of it's like two to three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil a day, reducing the risk of Alzheimer's by you know, 50, 60, 70%. And these are observational studies, so I'm not saying this is cause causation, but again, the research did a really good job accounting for other uh, potential confounding factors. So that just, it tells me that this food really has a propensity towards supporting cognitive function. But with your olive oil, this is one of the most important things to be careful <laughs> with what you're buying, all right? I've seen, I've been to people's house and I'll see olive oil sitting on their counter in a plastic bottle, all right? In a clear bottle, as well, olive oil is photosensitive. And I don't think we realize this as well oftentimes, I know I didn't, that it's actually, there's a chlorophyll content in there. It kind of gives us this kind of greenish hue to greenish. it. Yeah. You know, so that chlorophyll is, it has that photosensitivity to it as well. It's one of the aspects, but anyways, being that it's photosensitive, light breaks it down and can accelerate oxidation and make the oil go rancid. So this is why you find olive oil, most of the time, even if it's lower quality, in dark glass bottles, because it's protecting, this is how stuff has been done. Our ancestors figured this out a long time ago. We've gotta keep this in a dark condition and also putting it in glass because also plastics photodegrade too. And so light breaks plastics down, but it can take again, a couple centuries for you know a pl small amount of plastic to fully break down but it's happening, M micro amounts are happening every, all the time when it's under light. If anybody's had the experience of leaving a plastic water bottle in a car, right. you know, and then having a sip, like you can taste the plastic, like it tastes funny. It leached in there. Yeah, and so water's a solvent. So you're drinking a plastic tea, you know, but with these oils and some of the compounds in there, some of the acids, that can even exacerbate that breakdown of plastic more. So we wanna get, make sure that our extra, extra virgin olive oil, extra virgin, so it's cold processed, and that tells you something else. Like if this is cold processed, they do so much to keep it cool, do I wanna cook it? <laughs> maybe, maybe not, maybe not. We can, and it is a, a safe oil, but it's low temperatures, low temperatures. If we're gonna cook, use oil for cooking at higher heats, we wanna use something more stable, saturated fats. The saturated fats, we're talking about the saturation of hydrogens on that, uh, the chemical structure. And so it just makes it more stable. Whereas once we get into mono unsaturated fats, we're having some spaces missed for those hydrogens and it makes it a little bit more unstable. So now it has like a flex to it. Polyunsaturated fats are much more unstable, but we need all of these, right? So with olive oil, low temperature cooking, but mainly using it to make dressings, using it as a quote finisher. After you plate your dish, drizzle some olive oil on top, you know, oftentimes, you know, if I make a salad, you know, I'll just, even if I have a, a, a salad dressing, you know, I get the good stuff. I'll even throw in an extra tablespoon of olive oil in there as well. It, it, not, besides just the health benefits, it's like, I, I crave it, Yeah. you know? Uh, and, I, and there's there's a couple, we'll link to one of the studies. There was one study out of Italy where researchers were giving people up to a liter of olive oil a week, mm. right? Like a massive amount. Yeah, Somebody thinks right. like a liter of olive oil a week, and they found all these benefits. I don't have it on hand, you know. I don't want to pull it up on my computer right now, but we'll link to it over there. And um, and you know, just to build on top of it. And there was a big book. I, I wanted to interview the author. I'm forgetting the name now, but he wrote about the the sort of um, how dirty the olive oil industry is, mm. and have to be really careful because a lot of olive oils are cut with um, you know these hydrogenated seed oils that are out there right, yeah. canola oil or whatever. So shooting for, you know, the ones that are, have that, whatever certification you're looking for, yeah. that is making sure that this thing is pure. Because if you probably roll up to your normal grocery store, Ralph's, other stuff, there's probably a decent amount of olive right. oils. Even if they say extra virgin, they're cut they're cutting with it, other they're things. Making, they're making it into crack, basically. They're making it into you crack. Know, it's not just that pure, they've got this kind of crack version of right. their olive oils out there. <laughs> And this is so true, you know, and then we get in that conversation about what happens when we consume those types of oils, right? Right. And I've got s these wonderful people in my life. Dr. Kate Shanahan is another one of those folks. She's one of the foremost experts in this topic of these highly refined seed oils. And now it's not that these are inherently bad. I'm not saying that, 
uh, when we have an extraction from, you know, a peanut oil or, you know, uh, a macadamia nut oil. But what we are talking about here are things like rapeseed. We're talking about canola. We're talking about soybean oil that is marketed as vegetable oil, quote, vegetable oil. But that's not kale oil. It's not broccoli oil. It's it's manipulation and marketing. And I remember my family making that switch over and started frying French fries and fish and vegetable oil and thinking it's so much healthier. And again, for, for myself, nine out of 10 people in my family, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, you name it, somebody's got something. And really almost 10 out of 10 people, you know, include myself included. You know, I had this degenerative spinal condition when I was just a kid, I was 20 years old, but that was years in the making to have this advanced arthritic condition. The physician told me I had the spine of an 80 year old man when I was 20, all right? And I now when I hear that and I think about it, I'm just like, there's some 80 year olds that are killing it out here that are doing great. You know, it's not, it's just what we've associated with aging, you know, in our culture today. And so anyways, um, the seed oils. Yeah, and and having this experience where we're inundated with all these different seed oils today and thinking that it's healthier, this is a major problem. One of the primary journals, one of the top journals in inhalation toxicology, I cited in Eat Smarter, found that simply smelling seed oils while cooking can damage your DNA. Dude, this is gonna sound crazy, but growing up, you know, my family, they're vegetarian and you know, growing up and everything like that, we're from India, and everywhere go over there, like, you know, I mean, here too, but it's all cooking with seed oils, right? It used to be coconut oil, other things like that, but now it's all ghee. seed oil, ghee. And then everybody was convinced that they came to America, and this is the better way of doing it, margarine, seed oils, other stuff, let's get rid of the ghee and not cook with that anymore. And my mom growing up would make this this dish, it's like a, like a little flat, flat bread, and it's called Puri, it's like uh, from the tradition in the region that I'm from in India, Gujarat, and you would kind of fry it. It's like a, it's like a little uh, fried bread that's there. And she would cook it downstairs and kind of fry it on Sundays. It was something that we'd have with like chai, and we'd have puri, like a little bit of bread and coffee in the morning, kind of our version of it. And when they would cook it, I'd be sleeping, you know, sleeping mm -hmm. in on a Sunday, yeah. and I'm in high school, middle school, and I would get the worst headaches oh every God. Sunday when she would cook this, you know, downstairs the windows are open, everything like yeah. that, but upstairs hot air rises and our whole house would be fueled, fooled with these fumes from this vegetable oil that was there. And I'd wake up with almost like, not full on migraines. I didn't even know what migraines were back then, but like really severe headaches. And even still to this date, when I am in a place that doesn't have good ventilation or if I go to a restaurant, we're meeting friends and they're not using the best oils that are there. I can see an impact, right, on my brain cognition and function, and it feels like a, a little bit of like my brain's being suffocated. Oh, that's such a good analogy. That's such a good analogy. And this is the N of one, but this is the most important data. Right. That we ignore. It's not to extrapolate out to everybody else, but it's to pay attention to your own body. Yes. Because my body is going to be different than somebody else's, but if we can find these little quirks for ourselves, yeah. it's all just about putting ourselves in the right direction for health. And the key here is you paying attention to it and making the association, right? So that you, you see that, okay, it's happening when this thing is happening, cooking this particular thing, and then I, I have the associated headache. And so the question is why, what's going on there? Well, these things are so, so freaking toxic. The manufacturing plants to take, we'll just say, you know, soybean oil or canola oil and to turn it into something that is palatable by humans the bleaching, the deodorizing, the high heat processing. It's like a 20, it's like a 13 to 27 step process. It's not, it's not extra virgin. It's been <laughs> around the block a lot, a lot before it gets to you and it's palatable. That's the thing. It's, it's just like, it's so distant from anything natural at this point. And now here's the biggest part. And this is the, the freakiest, scariest part, but also we can, we can change this taking biopsies from humans, so literally just taking and, and analyzing the, their fat tissue and looking at what's, what are their fat cells made of from folks earlier in the earlier part of the 1900s versus today. 
And so looking at biopsies from the average person, again, about 100 years ago, the amount of polyunsaturated fats, which are again, primarily in our diet are from these highly refined seed oils, but we find it in natural foods and they're great. There's wonderful processes that they do. The, the makeup of the average human fat cell of PUFAs, polyunsaturated fats, was about two to, two to 4%. Today, the average person's fat cells, when doing a biopsy, is made up of about 25% polyunsaturated fats. Literally, the ingredients that make up the human body are different now. We're made of these things. It's, it's not just like, oh, yeah, we're just consuming these things, it's doing all this stuff. No, it's literally making your fat cells out of this very, very volatile type of fat. Because as mentioned, they're not stable, right? So you're going to be more subject to, we'll just use an analogy with our skin, for example, and sun exposure. You're out there cooking yourself in canola oil, basically, because your cells are literally made of this stuff. It's not a joke. And we see this increased incidence of skin cancer, which is like, oh, you just need to wear sunscreen. No, that's not what it's about. What are you made of? What is the sun interacting with? And so this isn't just a small thing. And the primary way that folks are consuming this is through processed foods, obviously, you know, and then we're proactively cooking with these things and it's very abnormal. We have not done that in the history of humanity ever. A new experiment. New experiment. But what we have been using, ghee, butter, animal fats, you know, tallow. We've been using coconut oil. has been around for centuries. We've, we've been using these types of fats that are much closer. They're just basically food, Fat extraction. Step on it or cook it a little bit and then it's ready to go. That's it. Food, fat extraction. Not this, again, 20-hour process. All of these chemicals added to make it palatable because it would just it would taste so terrible for, for us to try to consume those things. And so the bottom line is this. Again, these being so volatile and easily damaged, what, what they would do to increase the stability of them is to hydrogenate them. Right, so par partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, that's what margarine is, for example. And I remember, I was just a little kid, and I remember when my grandmother made the switch from butter to country crock. Because, you know, the, the doctor that my grandfather was seeing was like, hey, you, you know, you've got high blood pressure, you've got these different things, start using, you know, get rid of the fat and start using these, you know, uh, vegetable oil spreads. My grandfather, within the next couple of years, ended up having two heart attacks. Because all these seed oil fats that are not really plant vegetable fats, they are super inflammatory. This goes back to the conversation of not just neuroinflammation, just total body inflammation. And the rhetoric, you know, the the, the absence of education in these things, it's very blanket statements, you know, that we got into this fat phobia, you know, you want, he's trying to help him, but he's going off of the small bit of data that he was informed with, you know, and, you know, our Mark, for example, Mark Hyman, he's been one of those folks who's really come from that paradigm and seeing what that looks like, and then really understanding just how much our food matters. And taking that data, you know, in conversations with Mark, for example, with how little our medical professionals are taught about food. And today, not even just that, but miseducated about food. Mm. And so then that's getting sent out in mass to patients, this really poor dietary advice and wondering why they're not getting the results. And oftentimes what happens is, and me being in this field for as long as I have as well, unfortunately, we think that the person's lying. We think that they're not following the diet program. They're not cutting their fat. They're out here guzzling, you know, whatever it is, and they're just lying. When nine times out of 10, they're working hard. They're really trying the thing, but it's not working because it was never designed to work. Mm, such so, a yeah, such a key point. And no affiliation with this company, but one company that I do want to mention, which is an at-home test, is called Omega Quant. And I, it's, a, it's 99 bucks. Anybody can do it. It's a little prick test that you get sent home, and you can actually see what kind of fats is your body made out of. Mm. And it's tons of peer review evidence. They have an incredible clinical board that's out there. And it's not only something that I mentioned for people who are traditionally more vegetarian, vegan, other stuff, because I came from that world. It's also for people who don't realize how much processed food that they're eating and how much their body is literally. It's like you went from using high quality bricks and stone to build your house yeah. to now you're using 
paper mache or like really, you know, uh, messed up Legos or something like that. <laughs> and, and a little bit of wind comes, a little bit of sun stress, whatever, and your whole house gets knocked down. And that's what we're doing with our body is we're building our fats out of these really bad materials. So just a resource that's out there. You don't need a doctor. It's just an at-home test that people could do and immediately get results in terms of what does your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio look like? Because like you said, it's not that these things that we don't want to demonize them. It's when that ratio gets out of control that we start to get real challenges that right. are there. Because those fats, if we're talking about uh, these seed oils, you know, this quote vegetable oil, they're very high in omega-6 fatty acids, which again, there's a tendency in our in our inner circle for those to get demonized. Omega-6s are important for so many processes in the body. Totally. They're used, literally it can be used as an energy source. They're, that's a, that's the primary use, but then they're used for different structures to make up, again, like I mentioned, making up our body fat tissue. Um, so that it's not that they're bad, but they are, and also inflammation gets a bad name because we need, in, we need inflammation. Inflammation is the, the immune response. It's the process that happens when new cells are being made and old cells are getting removed. There's a, there's a balance there. We just don't wanna be in this hyperinflammatory state. But today, that ratio, historically, we were looking at maybe a th about a three to one, most scientists agree, three to one omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Today, the average person on the low end is 17 to one, all right? That's gone up, you know, four times higher, but that's the low end of it, right? So we're, some folks potentially is 50 to one and wondering why we're in this pro-inflammatory state in our bodies and in our brains. And so helping to shift that ratio over proactively, this is why DHA and EPA is so transformative, I believe, in these peer-reviewed studies is because people are coming in so out of balance with them, you know? So, so yeah, addressing that. if you had to put a top three, you know, we've been talking about the <clears throat> beneficial foods and nutrients for brain health, cognition, focus, and long-term avoiding of cognitive decline, Alzheimer's. So those are the, those are the positive ones. If you had to take three, that are really damaging our health, but especially our brain health. Would you put seed oils in that category? Absolutely. Top three? Easy, easy top three, easy top so three. So seed oils is one of them. Yeah. Any others that you would include in that top three? Sh sugar is definitely the, the number one. And I, I, I really, I'm coming from a place where I, I really understand though, I understand because sugar is, it's also beautiful. You know, it's associated with so many things cognitively, you know, from, you know, after your soccer game, you know, you get in the, the treat afterwards, you know, the, the ice cream or the pizza. Um, we've got everything associated with, you know, even love, Valentine's Day, you know, you're giving sweets. You know, it's, I, I don't want to completely demonize something that has a beautiful side to it for connection that's and part experience. of the nuance, right? That's the nuanced conversation that we have to have. That's it. But in our culture, it's so far swung to the other direction where it's we're inundated with this devastating, absolutely devastating amount of sugar for the average person that it's it's tearing our bodies up from the inside out. And so that's really what it is. So this for me, number one is sugar. I mentioned earlier about 70 pounds for the average American is consuming every year. 70 pounds. I heard it was like 200. I thought I thought we went from like 12 to 220 pounds. Yeah, so this is added sugar. Added sugar. Which is, again, what's added in addition to the sugar, sugar contained yeah, within yeah. the foods. Yeah. So now we can get up somewhere in the ballpark of maybe 150 pounds of sugar a year for the average person. Uh, but again, it depends on where you look. I always like to err on the side of where we have the most evidence and so, again, for the average person, somewhere in the ballpark of 70 pounds of added sugar, which is insane. Okay, that's like, uh, I don't know, that's like a fourth grader. That's like the size of a fourth grader of sugar. <laughs> um, so anyways, we've got that being one of the biggest issues. I already mentioned this. That consumption is, it's, 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 it's insane. It's, it's so much, and it's driving so many different metabolic breakdown points. So we've got sugar. Then we've got the vegetable oils, these highly refined oils. And then I would say the the third one, I don't even know why I'm struggling to say this, but it's so, it's diverse, but I'll just say it in a, it's umbrella point, which is pesticides consumption. Mm. So pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides, fungicides, side means to kill, 
you know, but it's really designed to kill very small organisms through most of the time they're either estrogenic or neurogenic. And man, the amount of pesticides that people are consuming today, like we, we haven't even gotten our finger on it exactly because again, people aren't, this people is being studied now, don't get me wrong, but the level to which it just takes time because those, this industry is so powerful. We're talking about big agriculture. They're using these very cheap compounds to increase their yield. They can, they don't care. Their number one objective is not your health, it's to make money. And so anything they can do to fight this information getting out, but anyway, so they're either estrogenic or neurogenic. And one of the studies that I shared recently on my show, which was one of the most eye-opening for me, was that we've got chlor chlorpyrifos. Let me use chlorpyrifos as an example. It is well established now that chlorpyrifos increases the rate of brain development abnormalities for infants in, in the womb, higher rates of, uh, of miscarriages for women who are pregnant, who are exposed to chlorpyrifos, but it's been caught up in red tape for years. It was actually about to be banned, but then it's kind of found its way back into circulation where it's still being able to be used without, uh, without, without much warning to it. And so that's just one example, but one of the interesting studies was that pesticides were found to disrupt microbial gene expression. All right, so this is a good point to, to emphasize here in this episode too, is that you, and you've talked about this multiple times on your show, the majority of genes that we have, so we, we look at ourselves and we see we're human, but we have upwards of four to 10 times more bacteria that make us up, you know, depending on who you talk, talk to. So we're talking 40 trillion, 100 trillion microbes, you know, in the form of bacteria living in and on our bodies. But it's not just that, which we, there's supposed to be a symbiotic nature. You also have all of these bacteria genes as well. They have genes too. And they're running processes and functions that influence human functionality. This is one of the cutting edge places that we're at right now. And so if we go gene for gene, 99% at least of the genes that you carry around are microbial genes, mm. not even human genes, all right? And there's the diversity of those genes, like when we did the Human Genome Project, which I think there's still some flaws here, finding there's somewhere in the ballpark of maybe 22,000 genes we share collectively. Bacteria, those 99% that you carry, if we're going gene for gene, is so much more diverse. We're talking about millions and millions of different genes because they've had more time to develop and evolve and face off against different things for them to survive versus us you know, as humans, this outpicture of where we are today, those genes inherently affect us. So to, to know that pesticides are detrimental to microbial gene expression. Designed to kill them intentionally. That's scary stuff. What is that doing to our gene expression? What is that doing to our microbiome? What is that doing to, you know, our, our gastrointestinal tract? What is it doing to our heart health, our brain? When I say that most pesticides are estrogenic or neurogenic, it's, that means they have to be damaging to the, the nervous system of the, pesticide, the pest. But we're just like, oh, we're, we're bigger than a, a bug. It's not gonna affect us. Right. But they Or nobody knows the total exposure that we get over the course of, of a lifetime, eating three meals a day right. and getting it in concentrated forms and processed foods. Right, and the fact that we're just looking at that isolated thing. Whereas today, we know that our microbiome is really a major hub, if not the hub, of the expression of our health. It's like the, the, the garden where everything is really growing from. You know, and talking with um, Dr. Emmer and Mayer out there at UCLA, and you know, he's been studying this for 40 years before anybody knew the word microbiome. So back when people thought he was nuts, like, <laughs> what is this? What are you looking at these, you know, gut micros for? Like, that doesn't impact anything. Whereas today now it's a really, it's a buzzword really, but the science there is so, beautiful and expansive. But when we understand that this pesticide isn't, it's not about damaging the human cells. They're definitely 1000% damaging our microbes. These are small organisms, smaller oftentimes than the pests they're trying to kill with these compounds that are neurogenic. And our bacteria have a version of a nervous system, but oftentimes they're considered to not have a nervous system, but they're able to sense, they're able to sense the environment to sense a form of, of pain and move away from that. 
to sense temperature, all these different things. We we just don't understand it yet, but we just throw it out like, oh, bacteria, they don't, they're, they're stupid. They're dumb. They don't know what's going these on. Stupid They'll bacteria. <laughs> you know, they don't even have a brain. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're here controlling the show. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so, and also the reproductive cycle of our microbes, you know, and understand these compounds are, are estrogenic. And we know now we have some pretty sound data on it affecting the reproductive cycle of humans as well. Clearly, again, it, the development of the brain in the example of chlorpyrifos, which is just, that's just one. That's just one of the many that are approved by the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, supposed to be protecting us. We're part of the environment too, EPA, you know. And so this is all coming right now, but we don't have to wait for it to be the definitive, you know, to make it to mainstream. Even, and the funny thing is right now at this time that we're living in, man, where this, the, 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 the data will come out, but if it, if it isn't something that makes you hate somebody else or makes you upset and angry and want to fight and just connecting so much in fear, it's just here today, gone today. It, even if it makes a headline, it's here today, gone today. Most people never know it. Because the biggest thing that we experienced recently that the numbers have changed even since I saw you last, if you go to the CDC site and you look up the comorbidities along with COVID-19. It's right there in plain sight. You can see it. 95, over 95% of the people who passed away with SARS-CoV-2, over 95% had an average of four pre-existing chronic diseases and or comorbidities. It's, un, it's, uh, it's almost so strikingly obvious, yet we're not doing anything about it. As far as like the big top down change, it's not being addressed. Our underlying susceptibility, the biggest underlying susceptibility is our, is our health. What are we doing to improve that? And so that's my mission. I know this, my mission, I know this is your mission as well. That's why I, I, I appreciate you so much because the crazy thing is, you know, um, platforms like this are the most influential. You know, a lot of folks have kind of tuned in that the major media is not they're not invested in, in your best interests necessarily. It's t really turned into the reality TV in a sense, mm. you know? And we've all, we've all been inundated with reality TV, but it's not reality. There's so much going behind this. Reality thing. TV is the most scripted right. TV. To make things appear a certain way and also to make you at odds with other people inherently, no matter what news you subscribe to, it's still, they're doing the same template, which is to, to get you inundated with fear and to make you focus on an enemy of sorts, right? Because that just drives connection, that drives ratings. And we've got these characters who are playing these roles. They're not sharing the news anymore. We don't have investigators who are really going out and looking at, for example, the, the, the pesticide industry and how much harm it's causing, how it's you know some but super rare it's like very Car rare carrie gillum and other yeah. stuff it's There's rare some great reporters out there but their stories oftentimes they don't even get published or right. you know they've got to do it themselves and they don't get as much traction there's some wonderful reporters out there doing great work i know some of them as well but what we're seeing in the major media and also even local news is oftentimes you know 99 percent better as far as like getting some data but my son this is a true story just yesterday because I, when i turned my television on it's automatically on this spectrum news on the, you know, it's like a news channel, like a 24 hour. Thing. Yeah. And so I turned it on because I was going to put something on for us. But then I was like, I had to respond to a meeting. So I'm like handling this on my phone, this meeting. And my son, he was like playing with his Legos. And then I finished the, the email. And then he turns to me, he's like, dad, why does the news just talk about bad stuff all the time? And I didn't even realize, all it had been was like five or 10 minutes. And all it had been was just all these bad things that were going on that he caught. I never talked to him about the news before ever. We don't have the news going in my house. And a child was able to point this out. And I shared with him that, you know what, son, because 90% of the news is about all the bad things happening in the world, not all the good that's happening. The lowest common denominator of humanity, as Reverend Michael Beckwith says. Yes, exactly. And the world is taking a nightmare pill, is another thing that he says. And it's 90 it's ninety percent all the problems that are going on, and plus the sports and the weather. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> and the news really has become a lot more sports-like. If you start to pay attention to that, yeah. Like even with the election, you know, it's like a lot more like you've got the you've got the the polls and the ratings and like you've got the scoreboards and just like and making it more like are ESPN. You on? Who are you rooting for? Right. Instead of really what you know you're trying to do with your platform, which you, what you are doing with your platform is really helping people understand that we are the CEOs of our own life. Yes. So we, as a CEO of a company, we have to choose who's part of our team. Yeah. We have to hire and fire the people that are gonna make this organization, our household for our families, our health, especially, we gotta be the CEO of our health, and we have to make these decisions in terms of who are we gonna let into the boardroom? Yeah. Who are we gonna give a voice to? Who are we gonna get a chance to listen to? And most importantly, what are we gonna take action on? Right. That's when, when we understand that we are, we can either be part of the problem or we can be part of the solution. Yeah. And we're that gatekeeper. That's when our life starts to change. Because then we were headed in one direction, which might have been taking us more towards a disease state. And I just don't mean in health, I mean in thinking and mindset and everything else. And then we take a little bit of a U-turn because we start listening to different information and now we're thriving. Yeah, It's a whole different way, a whole different outlook that's out there. Yeah, and it's available. And I had a recent affirmation on how powerful this is because all that's going on in the world, all the political infighting, all of the, the, the poor state of health that is just pressed into our faces all the time, our susceptibility to chronic and infectious diseases. When I saw you last, you know, this is right before Eat Smarter came out. Right. And when Eat Smarter came out, and this was at the beginning of, of the year, it came out December 29th, uh, 2020, right into that first week of 2021, and it became the number one new release book in the United States. Huge. And it was just for a, a few uh, a few moments because we sold out of copies, which everybody's pointing at COVID, pipeline delays, all these things. But to see a book on health, on food, become the number one new release book in the United States at a time when it seems so much counter to that really, really lit me on fire because I know that this matters. People care about this stuff, even if they don't realize it. But it's the accessibility, it's the education, it's making it fun and joyful. So much about health has been turned into this, like everything is hard, you gotta struggle, you gotta, you're gonna die trying to be healthy. When it's any, anything, it could be so much further from the truth. And so that happened, it was like t I, somewhere around the top 10 of all books, fiction and nonfiction, after you know, it was all said and done. And you know, right now at this time, we're, we're doing a resurgence for Eat Smarter and what I'm really wanting to do is to, you know, make sure that this education is getting into the places that it needs to be, you know, because there are people who listen to podcasts like this who are passionate about health, who are passionate about becoming better, just being better, whether it's healing from a, a, a disease state or whether it's just wanting to be the best version of yourself. But I want to take that into our family construct in our communities. I know a lot of people have experienced this. I know that I have. You know, I've been in this field for almost 20 years and I've impacted the lives of, it's crazy, but millions of people at this point. And in my clinical practice working with, you know, and all the you know, workshops and all these different things that I've done, thousands of people in that context and seeing that impact. But the biggest struggle for people coming in is their family. You know, like I heard this so many times, if my, if my kids would just, or if my husband would just, or if my parents would just, and having that hard time of connecting with their family members with improving their health, because we tend to be, quote, stuck in our ways. But I promise you, I have not met one person, not one, who doesn't want to be healthy, mm. ever. It's for them, cognitively, it might be unattainable for them or it might be too difficult. But again, nothing could be further from the truth. And so with that said, that's the way that I created Eat Smarter, was to be approachable, approachable and fun and interactive for people no matter what level they're at. So the most esteemed researcher and per person who was like at the top of their game. And this is what, what I had the great honor of having access to is folks like Mark Hyman, folks like Dr. Daniel Amen, being able to sign off on the book and to learn things themselves, right? So no matter what level you're at, and then for everybody, the everyday person, we had a national campaign with Target 
for a book on food, which was a prominent feature in all the Target stores in the United States. That doesn't happen. There's something special about this book that is attainable for everyday folks. And so really passionate about it, man, and just wanting to get this education into our school systems, into our, you know, our universities. These are all things that I was doing in a one-on-one a one-to-one -one kind of context or one-to, you know, group where I'm going and I'm doing a guest lecture for this university or that. No, I wanted to I wanted to change the education system itself. And so that and also our community wellness, you know, just getting our communities healthier. And this is the opportunity that we have today is not just providing education, but what can we do to provide funding to create the wellness programs, to, uh, to give accessibility to healthy food, to give accessibility to uh, community parks and recreation centers. These are all things that we can do through government change, policy change, but also ourselves working hard, building ourselves up, getting ourselves healthy, and we can change the world. It's happening right now as we speak. Hey YouTube, if you like this video, you're gonna love this recommended video with my dear friend Dave Asprey, all on fasting. <laughs> By skipping breakfast and doing it without hunger, you can teach the cells in your body, hey, stay young, stay flexible and efficient at being able to turn 